Welcome to World Creativity and Innovation Week. We're so pleased that you are able to join us. My name is Jerry Manal, and I'm going to be moderating a roundtable conversation. Let me introduce you to who is at the table. Hueda Athen began her career at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston as an intern, earned her master's degree in museum studies at Harvard University, and then became assistant director at the Armenian Museum in Boston, and later the director of development at the Museum of Science and History in Jacksonville. Having spent the majority of her career in the museum trenches, Athen has experienced the operations of arts organizations from different levels and is drawn to collaborative work and the mission of arts organizations. Throughout her career, she spent her time doing things she feels committed to, emphasizing the importance and accessibility of visual culture. Athens excited to be leading the Morian, an organization that's been a part of this community for more than 100 years. She believes that the Morian can take a leadership role in the evolution of the arts and is excited to help it move forward in the goal of forging a culture of creativity and inclusion. We also have Kathy Durden. She has a unique combination of varied background in management consulting, leadership, development, and arts. Kathy has had a broad-based career encompassing client service and, and organizational management. After over 25 years of management consulting experience, Kathy changed her focus to an area about which she has always been passionate, enhancing and encouraging individual development. Kathy is a certified Hudson Institute coach and an associate certified coach by the International Coaching Federation. Her focus is individuals in transition, assisting them in furthering their careers, find or reconnect with the passions, identify their goals, and achieve their own objectives. Kathy has a Bachelor's of Business Administration with a concentration in accounting from the College of William and Mary. She is a CPA in Virginia and Florida and a certified fraud examiner. Kathy is also a nationally recognized watercolor artist. She has exhibited across Florida as well as nationally from New York to California. She was included in the 2013 Watercolor Artists Ones to Watch and is a signature member of many state art organizations. She is also the 2012 president of Florida Watercolor Society and is now its director of operations and the president of Tampa Regional Artists and is on the board of PBBCA. Next, we have Susanna Wayman. She's the executive director of Tampa Bay Business for Culture and the Arts. Founded by Tampa Bay business leaders in 1989, this nonprofit Tampa Bay BCA is one of the National Business Committees for the Arts. For over 30 years, TBBCA has united businesses to champion arts and culture for a prosperous community, leveraging private sector support of arts and culture as vital economic drivers, catalysts for innovation, creativity, transformation, and as essential contributors to quality of life. TBBCA is a proud member of Americans for the Arts and the national partnership movement that connects, motivates, and recognizes the business community's key role in strategically aligning in support of the arts because the arts are good for business and business is good for the arts. Susanna Weymouth has long been involved with the arts and culture and education. Since taking the helm of TBBCA in January 2015, Weymouth's business acumen and leadership skills and passionate advocacy for the arts have led to transform, transformative relationship and community building, successful fundraising and stewardship, and high impact programming. And if you don't know me, I'm Jerry Manal, together with my late husband, abstract surrealist artist Scott Manal, brought over three decades of leadership to the visual communications and art businesses that we co-founded and have built from the ground up. Over the years, we have acquired other businesses and forged strong collaborations to promote the arts as well as attracting our own clientele for art, both residential and wide-ranging commercial projects. My Favorite Art Place serves both wholesale and retail clients with fine art printing and custom art framing. 
while my business has both a retail and wholesale component, my focus is helping businesses brand themselves and create culture through the use of artwork. So this is who you'll be hearing from today. And enough about us, let's get on to the good stuff and help you find your new normal. It has often been said that artists are in the vanguard. Susanna, can you speak to how this relates to such a time as now? Well, thank you, Jerry, and thank you everybody for joining us here today. You know, these are certainly unprecedented times uh, and the role of the arts really in many ways thrust the center of the stage and are even more central to our society. Artists of all types are in the vanguard and I think are uniquely equipped to help lead the way in this crisis that we are traversing and the challenges that we're facing, not just individually, but that we are immersed in globally. So why is that? Well, visual artists, writers, poets, actors, musicians, vocalists, performers are all creatives. And creativity involves two processes, thinking and then producing. If you have ideas, but you don't communicate them, you're imaginative, but not creative. So artists have long understood that the entire act of creation is a problem solving process. It could be how to play a character, how to perform a piece of music, what tone and tenor pauses and emphases. You know, creativity comes by experimenting, exploring, questioning assumptions, synthesizing information. Artists draw from all of this and from their foundation of knowledge and their tools and techniques and mastery of their disciplines. And they also draw from insight and knowing how to tap into innovative ways to approach a problem or a challenge, how to find patterns or make connections between seemingly unrelated phenomena. That's what's coming into play here. Artists don't just use their imagination and come up with ideas, they act on them. So since creativity is the foundation of innovation, the act of turning out something new, then of course, artists are best set to be innovators because they're ready to take ideas and from those create a new reality. It's this ability, right, to do something different, try something new. It's this positive act of creation where our artists generate solutions. And because artists are constantly exercising their abilities to innovate, it would make sense that they could be best positioned to generate better solutions. So we're in this period of great change. And now, perhaps more than ever, we're desirous of creative responses from artists. And maybe not just desirous, but really expecting it, craving it. The world is looking to artists to lead the way and help make the process fun, engaging, collaborative, and to create those kinds of positive experiences that help speed up the adoption of new ideas. I uh, guess, Jerry, that a momentous question faces us, and that's what kind of future do we imagine? What is the new normal? I'd say that artists are our greatest I call them agent provocateurs, that can lead us to necessary new ways of thinking about a future that, well, maybe is already here. Artists are uniquely positioned for the bridge that we need to build beyond the crisis to the new world on the other side. We need artists to help us look at our changing world in different ways and to help us engage with the new world in new ways. You know, any situation like this that presents such major challenges and offers major, it offers major opportunity. If you look at Google, Google's big on that moonshot thinking, they call it, understanding how a problem unfolds, asking big, bold questions, seeing and experiencing change, setting your sights on incredibly ambitious, groundbreaking innovations. And that's what I think we're, we're, we're aiming for, the moonshot thinking. Look at how artists have addressed other issues like climate change, generating options, sharing with the public, finding ways to evaluate them. So in many ways, the bigger the concept, the more it stimulates further work and ideas and the more creative the solution. You're absolutely right, Susanna. We've always talked about 
necessity being the mother of invention. And when we take a look at the great periods of art and take a look at what was needed for the culture at that time, it makes a lot of sense. But when we take a look at a time like now, change can be difficult. And so Kathy, could you speak to points of change and how to process change? It's one thing to take a look, of course, uh, at the larger companies, but how about if we bring it down to the individual artists or some of the smaller art organizations and art businesses? You're absolutely right, Jerry. Change is really hard. It brings in a lot of emotions personally. It's very scary. Not everybody experiences change the same way and not everyone experiences the same sort of change different, uh, the same way over time and different situations can bring up different emotions. But it's helpful to understand how you yourself deal with change. Look at your past experience with change. How did you deal with it? This can help you understand your current emotions. Did you welcome change? Were you frustrated? Was it lack of control that really bothered you? Change can trigger the same emotions as any transition. The stages of these emotions can be very similar to those we experience with grief. We start with shock. The immediate, re immediate reaction is disoriented and disconnected. And it's more pronounced if it's unanticipated, such as now. Then we end up in disbelief and denial. You're back carrying on, trying to do the everyday life, probably dealing with the kids and surviving. Intellectually, you know what's happening, but emotionally, you just box off that change. And it's easy to get stuck there. Then we get stuck in self-doubt, and that's very uncomfortable. We feel like we're in limbo, and our confidence might be very low, and you fear the future and you feel very isolated. And that's, it's very important to get out of that isolation and get out with other people. And that, not necessarily out with other people, but talking to other people. And finally, we get to acceptance, where you're starting to face the future. And that's where we want to be right now today. And we start to have, feel a little bit of energy as our confidence builds. And then we're going to start with some fun experimentation and start exploring what we could do different. You try different things before setting forth. We have a search for meaning where we start to process where we've been. And finally, we get to integration where we're comfortable and confident with our new life. You can't rush this. If you aren't in the right place, if you're still in disbelief and denial, you're not going to get to acceptance and experimentation immediately. You've got to get through and process to get to the right place. The other thing is change can trigger reptilian brain reactions. We all experience some that these when we're in an uncomfortable or scary situation. The reptilian brain, which is the limbic system in the back of your in the back of your head, takes over from the executive brain, brain, your cerebral cortex, at the front of your skull, triggering fight or flight. A lot happens when we start to experience these crippling emotions as we go from our executive brain to the reptilian brain. But we need to get out of that reptilian frame to get out of the fight or flight response. I have a blog because I don't want to spend a lot of time here on my K Durden Consulting website that gives you some tips on getting out of fight or flight. In summary, we need to understand what triggers our, our emotions. Notice the triggering events and the physical sensations that one experience when having what we call a reptilian hijack. And those physical sensations can be one of the ways we notice that, oh, we've got to stop, I've got to move out of the reptilian hijack and try and find the approaches and tools that get us out of that part of our brain. And these could include mindfulness, meditation, yoga, exercise, etc. Remember, we are resilient. We've been resilient in the past and we can be in the future. A resilient mind will adapt to and adjust in, any, in a way that you are in control. You can have small wins, creating opportunity to build momentum. It helps to build confidence and helps us move forward uh, beyond these limiting self-beliefs. Resilience brings security in a changing world. It helps us anticipate risk, become comfortable with change, absorbing those hard knocks, regrouping, and circling back. I do understand, and, and that's great to remind ourselves that we've been in tough spots before and we will get through this. I know that 
it makes a big difference whether you look at things positively or negatively. And it's hard to force oneself to look at things positive. What are some of the different effects of looking at situations positively versus negatively as a pep talk to remind ourselves why we do need to stay positive even in challenging times? That's absolutely right, Jerry. Positively helps us get to solutions. Negativity focuses us on the problem. A positive outlook leads us to more possibilities than negativity or even neutrality. It showcases the range of possibilities. It helps us to focus on what's possible out there and the possible outcomes, which negatively, negativity hides from view. Negativity focuses us on our stressful path, and we lose focus on the big picture. So we dwell on positive subjects and focus on the positive aspects of our life, where we can make a difference, where we have the possibility to have control and make change. You also want to hang out with positive people because positivity is contagious. And when I say hang out, I'm not saying be physically with them, but you can still hang out virtually. And it helps us to refine perspectives in a positive way. The more you take in new, more ideas and actions, the more you add to your toolbox. Well, thank you for that, because you've definitely given us some good uh, pieces to put into our toolbox. Since we're talking about creating a new normal, how could we set ourselves up to grow to be a better version of ourselves? So pinpoint the challenge, empower yourself, and have an approach of open-ended curiosity rather than closed-ended judgment. Focus on the opportunity. It's important to broaden our outlook, to have a wide, think of it as a wide-angle lens but camera. If you have a wide-angle lens, you see a lot more than if you've got a very narrow lens. Then take small steps, make changes, monitor results, and adjust as needed. Then take a step back and come up with another wide range of solutions. Tell yourself your problems are not personal failures and there's nothing permanent. Every event has a beginning and an ending. And again, putting that change in context. You have to have a process of dealing with all the emotions because otherwise you won't be able to move forward. Well, that all sounds very good and it makes good sense. But here we are in isolation in our own homes Sometimes it's very difficult to do all of this inside our own heads. So how can we do that? Well, social distancing doesn't mean isolation. And in fact, it's more important now than ever to be connected and to reach out to those that you're not connected to. And you can reach out to various ways, uh, break it, reaching out to your arts communities, reaching out to your, uh, to your uh, personal communities, to your art, local art groups. Facebook, Instagram, et cetera, very social media. Uh, Zoom is a great way to reach out and connect with people. I have friends who just decided that they needed to get together three times a week just to, to build, build their community to get back in touch with things. That's a great way of getting connected. They're, that's what your community is for, is to provide support. Don't be afraid for help. Every want to admit they feel isolated and alone but once you start talking to everybody you realize everybody feels the same way and you can share tips and tricks on how to get through things how to be resilient different um gratitude practices whatever works once you hear what others are doing it'll give you new ideas online arts communities can also be a source of feedback ideas resources and support you can still show your work virtually and gain feedback and your local art groups can help you with that support to move outside your comfort level. Just don't be afraid to ask for help. That sounds good. I wonder what some of the other arts communities are doing. Oh, so to brainstorm with other fellow artists, what is the Morian doing now to build community and stay connected to its audience? Well, thank you, Jerry, for inviting me. Um, the Morian's mission is to connect people with art, and we want to remain in touch with our audiences through these tough times. Uh, we hope to continue to involve our uh, community of artists in this. Um, they are truly our greatest strength. Um, 
as you know, it's all about uh, online engagement these days, and we began offering online opportunities to continue to connect people with art um, during this time. Um, as you know, the Morian is co-hosting World Creativity and Innovation Week. Uh, we have uh, two of our team members who will be presenting. Uh, Christo will be presenting on the Morian's Operation Art of Valor program, uh, which is our glass blowing program for veterans. Um, Andy Slough will be presenting on the Florida native plants um, in the Chihuly Collection Garden. Uh, we just recently participated in the virtual Second Saturday Art Walk. Uh, we are featuring works by our Morian artists through our online store. Uh, we also introduced the red, white, and blue Art of Valor glass flower made by our veteran heroes, who, and we are calling it Made by Heroes uh, for Your Heroes. Um, it's a great gift idea for people looking to honor uh, the first responders, nurses, the doctors, and other personal heroes in their lives. Um, we are featuring virtual exhibition tours and works by various uh, local artists. Um, we have two of our instructors who are offering online classes now, and we have artists providing online demos. Uh, we have moved our Saturdays at the Moria to an online platform, and we're really excited about um, the views that we're getting on that. Um, we also created social media messaging that speaks to the healing power of art in these uh, difficult times. Um, we're encouraging people to buy gift cards to use towards f uh, future classes or purchases um, to help support the Morian and all the amazing artists that we feature. And people can go to our website, morianartcenter.org, uh, to see all of these opportunities. Um, and Jerry, uh, as an organization uh, that has been in the community for more than 100 years, uh, the Morian has always been about accessibility uh, from the days of the Art Club of St. Petersburg in 1917. Um, it has strived to provide a dynamic art learning environment and we have spent the last year looking into how to um, dismantle barriers. And this pandemic has really forced this ushering of a new wave of the virtual, which has taken down barriers of uh, physical accessibility for us. Um, it really has allowed us to offer a bridge to a new and exciting range of things. Well, that is so wonderful. I know of so many people that have availed themselves of the classes that you have, found out about talents that they never realized that they had, found new ways of relaxing by expressing their creative, um, finding out what their creative expressions are with all the range of classes and that everything is available online. I, as I'm sure that many other people are starting to receive emails from people, there's so many opportunities out there. How can we use this time to reinvent ourselves? How can we use this time to figure out exactly what direction should I go if I'm an artist, if I'm a small creative business? if I'm a large creative business or an arts organization. It takes self-motivation to work on yourselves, to take up self stock on yourselves and figure out where you are, where you want to go. We all have a lot of things going on right now. Kids at home trying to get, keep them in school and trying to keep them going with their schoolwork, as well as a lot of messages out there distracting us. It's back to what we've always heard about the urgent versus the important. We have to make time for the important, even if it's not screaming urgent at us, because in the long run, it is important and it will eventually become urgent if you don't deal with it. It's more important than ever for us to know what we want to accomplish because there's so many directions we can go to in. And we have to be more focused and intentional in our connection and messaging to others. Most people are overloaded with messaging and are only going to respond to a message that really connects with, with what matters to them. Also, it's important to know we have to periodically think about change and how we are and where we want to be and move on. Begin by asking yourself from the inside to make, them, uh, to make the most of your time. It's similar to the information you've always needed to know, but it's more important now. It includes what are your objectives for creating art in the first place? What do you want to do going forward? What are the things you've always wanted to do but haven't done? And what's your brand? What distinguishes you from anybody else? What are you known for? 
what are you trying to communicate? And is what you're trying to communicate what you actually are communicating? What do people expect when they see your work? How do they know when they see a work by you that it's by you and that they immediately, it immediately registers, oh, that's by so-and-so. I know that person's work. I can see that that's that person's work. What are you trying to communicate? And are you trying to communicate something now that's different than what you've communicated before? Most of us are not int intentional. We just go from place to place and one thing to another. But as we explore opportunities and think about reinventing ourselves or expanding our offerings, we have to be intentional. We only have so many hours in the day and there's so many things we can do. That's not to say that we should immediately focus. We can brainstorm a long list, but after gathering data, we want to narrow down and focus. So I said gathering data. This includes determining why do people connect with you and your art? Who is your market? What are their demographics? Where do they hang out? Um, does your market and your target audience intersect with what you're trying to communicate? And how do they intersect? And how do you do this? Well, you have to ask. You, people love to give feedback. They love to provide you with their opinions. And then you want to review from the outside. Think about yourself as an artist and a business professional, because art is a business. What are your resources? And I don't mean just financial. I mean, also, what's your network? What are your connections? What uh, people do you know? What, what are their skill sets? What have you been doing that works from a, from a structural standpoint, from a technological standpoint? What have you thought you should do but haven't been doing and which might be relevant now, particularly in the technology space? How technologically connected are you? Do you have connections or resources that can help you if you're not that technologically connected? And uh, just give you pointers. Experience shows us that we rarely identify what we need to change as well as what's feasible and appealing at the beginning of any process to reinvent ourselves because our view is constrained by what we know. And this is a very important point. We don't know what we don't know. But we think we know what we, we think we know the sum total of everything that's out there. And in fact, all we know is what we have personally experienced. If we haven't experienced it, we don't know about it. So we need to get new information and then we need to investigate new ideas to see if they're feasible. So it's an information gathering outside of our experience process that we need to go about. This is why this process is very iterative. We explore, we recognize, question, dismantle our assumptions, make new assumptions, explore again, et cetera. It's important to have connections during this process. And it requires new roles and approaches, which require new contacts and new peer groups. The people who know us best uh, may be reinforcing our old identities. We need connections with new and different information that we don't get uh, because we don't have that information to give us the new opportunities to explore and facilitate our exploration. Again, we don't know what we don't know. We need new people to help us understand what we don't know. We need to shift connections to people who could help us with our new identities. These are usually people who are, might be new contacts or distant contacts on the periphery of our networks. They can help us move in new directions. By talking only to the people who know us in the past, we're limiting our opportunities to move us forward and towards wherever we want to go. Relying on a primary network is, becomes a barrier to experimentation. Think about it as one big game of telephone that everybody is just talking amongst themselves and you don't get any new information. It's impossible to change without expanding our professional circles. People on the outside of our networks know different people, bump into different information and have new ideas. And without getting that new, those new ideas, into our, pro into our scheme or our, our world, we won't know what we don't know. Our context can also bind us to an outstanding sense of who we are. We're pigeonholed. How many times have you talked to someone who only knows you for one thing, when you wanna be known for something completely different? New relationships are a safe place to try on new identities. We may feel that these are new offerings that we want to try, and we can only do that with our new, with new friends. 
or new contacts. Our old contacts we may feel might be giving, uh, might be not belittling, but dismissing our, our ideas and aspirations. Whereas our new contacts don't are not grounded in our old relationships and may feel and provide us just informative, good feedback. So set primary and secondary goals to help yourself. Use that time to figure out both on a short and long-term basis where you wanna go. Long-term, where do you really wanna go? Do you want, where do you wanna show your work? What, do you, what kind of work do you wanna do? Uh, what's important to you? Short-term, what do you need to do to get through this? And short-term, think creatively about how I can use my work in the current situation. Think about your demographic and your target market. What do they need right now? And what help can you provide them right now that both expands your offerings and provides new connections to you? What needs do they have and what can I fulfill? For each of these, you need to think about what you need to do to work towards your goals. Take small steps, make changes to your work plan, monitor the results, Take more small steps and adjust as needed. Small steps, make changes, monitor results and adjust as needed. That, that makes good sense and it all actually makes it sound like it's something that's doable, something confrontable. It also helps you provide a structure for yourself and you're more in control of what you yourself are doing because you have a plan. And on the idea of providing structure for yourself, I just wanted to reference the image which is on the screen. And many things that we've talked about, including a link to Kathy's blog, we will have links at the bottom of this, our presentation. But I do love this because this shows um, the sleep, work, social, education structure for many very, very famous artists. So I just wanted to point out this graphic because it's one that I really like. Moving on, Hueda, how does this apply to an organization rather than an individual artist? Jerry, uh, a number of the um, points that Kathy raised uh, apply, they relate to um, organizations as well. Um, it is very important to stay positive. Um, you can't lead an organization by having a negative outlook. Um, uh, you have to really have a positive outlook towards um, everything that's happening. Um, it's important to understand that this is beyond ourselves. Uh, this is beyond St. Petersburg, Tampa Bay, Florida, and all of the US. Everyone in the world is uh, impacted in one way or another. Um, it's important to accept that missteps will happen. Um, you also have to not be afraid to admit that you do not know what you don't know, as uh, Kathy mentioned, and to be able to adjust quickly. Um, this um, situation is moving very rapidly and you just have to be uh, flexible and adaptable and, and really adjust and uh, make decisions very quickly. And uh, for an organization, it's essential to focus on deciding with speed um, and again, flexibility and not so much precision. Uh, it's important um, to rapidly determine what matters most. Um, every organization, of course, is different, uh, but it's important to define a simple, scalable uh, framework, um, anticipate your next three, five, six roadblocks and obstacles, and focus on just creating important strategic goals. Gotcha. All right. So we've heard and we understand that we need to do the work to find the opportunity in all of this. But how do we do that? Well, I think it's time now to think beyond the physical in our person-to-person -person communication. For example, the number of people who can walk into a specific gallery is limited, but the people who could see your work online is unlimited. So start to think about new ways to connect with people digitally. Online presentations and teachings using different social media and streaming services. Online broadcasts considering services such as Zoom and Facebook Live. We have to think about doing outreach and push marketing. We can't expect people to find us. We can't just put something out there and assume that the world's gonna find us. Just as before, you're competing with many alternative 
for the eyes and time of the public. However, they might have fewer things to do and so might be more willing to explore and connect with you digitally. All right, so in our short-term goals, we want to update our LinkedIn, we want to update our Instagram, update our Facebook, make sure that that all speaks to our target market, make sure it all communicates our brand, get all of those things in order. And I can see how that works for the individual artists, the arts organization, as well as for businesses. Boeda, can you offer advice as to how to lead an organization at the time of crisis? Oh, well, Jerry, nothing prepares you for this, and um, we are all feeling our way through. Um, there are so many scenarios that you end up developing over the years throughout your career uh, about um, uh, dealing with a crisis, but nothing really prepares you for something of this magnitude in unpredictability. Um, a pandemic as it is evolving right now is a brand new experience for all of us and no one really knows when we'll be able to open and we're working very hard to make decisions day by day and week by week. Um, so definitely wrestling with the uncertainty is the biggest challenge in all of this. And, uh, we can't assign any new dates uh, to anything, not knowing when the circumstances will change. But um, it is important to anticipate that you will encounter unforeseen roadblocks. Uh, several operational challenges will drastically um, change the scope and responsibilities of everyone on your team. And meanwhile, you know, with our teams, we're navigating the health and safety concerns, working remotely uh, to support our families through the pandemic. And it's not easy. And of course, the learning curve is, um, is really steep. In our case, uh, after the health, safety, and well-being of our employees, the biggest concern for us is the financial impact um, on the organization, both in the immediate future and long term. So uh, we had to uh, lay down the groundwork, uh, the groundwork that explores, um, you know, financial impact of different scenarios. Um, we initially had to figure out our current cash reserves and cash on hand situation, and ask ourselves, you know, some really really tough questions. Um, and we considered for each scenario, at what point would we need to begin to take significant measures um, to cut costs to try and meet our uh, financial obligations. Um, so it's definitely important to define priorities, uh, think about business continuity, and try to find a balance between survival today and the organization's success tomorrow. Um, it's important to try and uh, create and deliver um, a culture of accountability. Um, it's important to understand how this also affects your team. Um, engage your team, motivate, communicate, and just do regular pulse checks on them. And just in overall, set a, uh, try to set a good example. Um, it's important to uh, take personal ownership, uh, even through the many challenges that are outside of our control. Um, as leaders, uh, we sometimes think that we're in control of any situation, um, but this is really beyond our control. So we um, should try to just uh, concentrate on the things that we can actually control. No, that makes exact perfect sense and I understand. Um, and I can see that those are all good advice points for, again, large organizations, nonprofits, for-profits, as well as individual artists that are trying to grow their business and trying to figure out how to navigate at this time. Um, one of the things that we talked about is that the most successful people and the most positive people are oftentimes viewed and are people who help others. So I would think that that would be very important at a time like this. Well, Jerry, I'm gonna jump in here and say that I think both Hueda and Kathy uh, gave some very helpful points. Hueda was talking about prioritizing. And Kathy said that the primary goal is helping yourself first. But then it's important to get outside of yourself and set a secondary goal to help others. And, you know, in some ways, artists are in the most privileged position to do this. And, and why is that? Well, because artists are used to and know well how to express their ideas. 
so they know how to communicate and they know really how to get their messaging out in very very talented and expert ways so now it's really more about finding the right platform for artists to amplify that voice and to help others it can make you feel so much better when you realize that you have immense talents expertise and experience and that you can bring those to bear on behalf of others you can offer those in these times and it can help you put your own situation into perspective as well and by listening to and gaining the perspective of others you can again generate those new ideas of how to approach or how to handle your own situation and it's these interactions that can create tremendous opportunity for positive outcomes to arise if you look at what's happening in italy and germany say uh, where artists are singing or playing instruments from their balconies they're giving of themselves they're using their talents to help uplift the spirit of their neighbors and their community uh, other artists and kathy is one example they're offering lessons and workshops as part of their business model and 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 other things that artists are doing pro bono and so they're using their skills and talents mentoring whether it's with other artists, whether it's with people they know, or an even broader, wider audience. The more that you can connect, the more your empathy comes into play, and you feel in solidarity, you're not just a contributor to the community, but you become a leader. And you're, in many ways, reaffirming your value to yourself, and concurrently to the outside world. I comes to mind the Daniel Pink 2006 book, uh, where it's called A Whole New Mind, Why Right Brainers Will Rule the Future. And he references the conceptual age of creators and empathizers. And really, artists are the creators and empathizers of our era. So artists can foster this culture of what one could call massive creativity, not just finding the creative solutions, generating creative solutions but also enabling other people to create and so in this time when audiences are self-isolating where venues are shuttered where events are canceled and where artists who are freelancers and have had their gigs go away you know the arts industry in general operates in public spaces so everybody's having to scramble to reinvent and Artists have responded to the current challenge for the most part with the kind of ingenuity that one would expect from highly creative minds. Uh, during a pandemic that prevents us from experiencing art and culture alongside others in the same physical spaces, our artistic community has really astonished us with the ways that it is thinking outside of the box and swiftly adjusting to this new reality, whether it's moving online or learning new technologies exploiting different platforms everyone is reevaluating approaches but i come back to how what is our arts community what is it like i believe very strongly our arts community is both creative and also resourceful and most of all caring i'm especially encouraged to see how the arts community continues to find ways to lend support one example is seeing artists making masks, helping healthcare workers when supplies of PPE are running out. Many have already been working on designing the different 3D model, 3D printed uh, types of face shields and all these other types of ways that artists are helping. Uh, artists are helping to craft messaging and that's really important in this time when as my colleagues have pointed out there's so much messaging that's inundating us we're looking to the artists who are good at this you know to lead the way and i think that our arts community really can be as i said amongst the the real sort of standouts of our era um if you look at the visualization word song performance imagine all of this is going to come out of this crisis. I think anthropologists and critics are going to one day look at the arts as produced during this time and about this time in our global history and learn a great deal. 
So it is important to stop and think, how do you as an artist want to be seen? Really, each of us will be judged by how we reacted, what we did, and how we led. I think artists are gonna be regarded as having been crucial to establishing a much more positive new normal, one where the arts are at the core of our existence. So being an artist right now is like being a cheerleader, an inspirational motivator, critic, coach, mentor, but really majorly leaders. It's the artists whom we are looking to, to universally encourage the world to use this time of crisis to learn, to learn to be more caring, to learn to be more connected to each other, to our planet, and to feel very much a part of a global community. The phrase, we're all in this together, isn't just about mutual sympathy. It's also a call to action for the future. And again, I see artists very much in the vanguard. Well, that to that role of creating art, artists have added the role of providing a type of help that is so important to our emotional well-being. Absolutely, Jerry. You know, it's if you think about it, what are we doing? We're looking online at visual art, we're listening to music, we're watching taped concerts. We can't be there, but we're looking for these balms for our souls. So artists are helping us cope. They're helping us overcome our anxiety, our depression, our sense of restlessness. And really they're helping us to stay optimistic and keep hope alive. And we're so fortunate in the Tampa Bay area, as well as uh, nationally with all of the different arts organizations that are available not only to provide help, to provide support, but also to provide resources and outlets for creatives to be able to give and take. And I'm I, so- Yeah, I agree, Jerry, with you. And, and I would just echo again what Kathy and Hueda have both said, which is that we have an enormous amount of resources in our community, but we're also creating new resources every day. Everyone's racing to try to respond, respond to the needs, respond to what can we do individually as organizations. You know, for TVBCA right now, we were founded 31 years ago with the mission to connect businesses to champion arts and culture. And now more than ever, this connection is critical. And I think that businesses are aware, not just of the plight of the artist, but also increasingly what artists have to offer. And the better that the new normal that artists help us to create reflects this ecosystem that is balanced and fair, the more positive that will be. I love that. I love that. Thank you very much. Um, Kathy Hueda, based on your many years of experience, how do you envision that artists, businesses, arts organizations will contribute to our new normal? It's a lot of, there'll be a lot of energy and we really can't even anticipate what people are going to come up with because we're, we are so creative. There's just new things that we can't even think of what they would be. But the other thing that I do see coming out of this is a urgency just to water platform. We at Florida Watercolor for Society, for example, had talked about uh, expanding our offerings so that we weren't focused just on our one face-to-face -face annual c convention, a big event, but still a one-time event that only impacts the people who can actually make it to a convention. We felt like we needed to expand both uh, to better help our members across the state of Florida and to better connect to the Florida public and had been talking about uh, going into a digital platform and, uh, and broadcasting art education uh, broader. And now we have a new urgency to get on with this. So we're working. <laughs> And Jerry, I think the um, changes that arts organizations make now um, will definitely strengthen them for the future. Um, I think people will want us to be uh, vibrant institutions. Um, in the aftermath of this, uh, people will be desperate 
flexibility. Uh, they'll be desperate for a sense of the original, having been stuck to their um, computer screens for a long time. Um, there's going to be a thirst for that uh, physical interconnectedness, and I have a feeling we'll be playing an important role in getting things back to normal and um, recalibrating new normal. Um, this period is definitely teaching us how to um, have a different dialogue with the public. And as Susanna said, this, uh, it, in, in things like that, there's always opportunity. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Well, we have some questions. So let's turn this over to question and answer time. Let me take a look and see. Part of what we're learning here in our new digital technology and what it is that we're learning to do is, you can't hear me? Ah, thank you. Okay. And somebody had asked, what is it that you're learning and how are you handling this new technology needs? And here has been a fine example of that because we are learning with this Zoom conference. We had so much information that we wanted to share and um, we're a collection of professionals that have a certain, some with lots of Zoom experience, some not so much experience and none of us have ever done uh, something of this magnitude. And so we appreciate everybody's patience um, as we work through this. And uh, lesson number one is make sure that you don't have any notifications on your computer. But I know that the content that we're offering is good. And let's get back to those questions. If you have a question, and we have been receiving some questions, that's what some of those dings have been, uh, just feel free to send them in. Um, we do have some that have been sent to us already, and we'll get started on that. This first one is for Kathy, our resident artist. And you were asked, where are the places that you draw your inspiration from, and has that changed? And how have you adapted during this time? So Artist Magazine in May had a page full of favorite art quotations, and I'm going to read some of them. Chuck Close. Inspiration is for amateurs. The rest of us just show up and get to work. Andy Warhol, don't think about making work, just making art, just get it done. Let everyone else decide if it's good or bad. While they're deciding, make even more art. Picasso, inspiration exists, but it has to find you working. So just start working. Uh, I was just glancing at the artist magazine for June and there was an article in there about uh, creating a summer, your own summer school program. So think about things that you, um, if you don't, aren't inspired, think about things that you want to work on and create your own curriculum and start working on it. Um, think about things that are helpful right now. I know that uh, one thing I've been focusing on is that Paintings that have more than 70% uh, green increase the dopamine and uh, serotonin in our brain. So I've been concentrating on green, as you see in the painting behind me. That's wonderful. I do know of a couple of artists that are taking walks around their neighborhood, looking for new things to see and using those for inspirations for the daily paint a picture a day or at least create something a day contest. Jerry, that's a great point. Look at things that you haven't noticed before. And with the time we have on our hands, we can notice a lot more than we have been noticing. I do hope that that's a trait that is one of the silver linings that comes from this so that when we go back to being so, so busy, that we don't, that we always preserve an hour or two each day or several times a week in order to maintain that. Definitely. Mary, I'd like to add in here, this is Susanna, 
that a lot of the museums and galleries and even individual artists are putting content online. And so perhaps one of the good habits that we can acquire now and take forward into the future is the instinct to turn to online content that many of those will continue to offer and to then uh, be able to take inspiration from looking at those as well. Absolutely, absolutely. It's one thing to be able to walk through a museum, but what a joy to be able to walk through and, and see so many different artists in the comfort of our homes. And oftentimes what the museums are putting online has explanations. So it's almost like taking a guided tour as if next best thing to being there. And then in a whatever time frame that can all go onto your bucket list. I loved this art piece. I'm gonna travel here to go see that. Well, here's the next question. Um, what is the best social platform to promote a creative business? Because we spoke so much about creatives and their businesses. So does anybody want to jump in on that one? Well, I'll jump in. I think it's, it depends on where, you're, where the people you're connecting hang out. So I would start trying a number of them and see and get some feedback as to what works, what doesn't work. But for example, if you're trying for a younger audience, go for, for Instagram or something um, that an old person like me may not even know about. But if you're trying for an older audience, Facebook. And Jerry, don't be afraid to explore and investigate new things. Uh, for instance, uh, people are uh, catching on to different ways of live streaming using YouTube, using some of the uh, platforms that Kathy discussed, and also Twitch. Even some of the museums are using that. And so, uh, and they're doing that for the first time. So don't be afraid to go out and see what's out there that you may not know, may not be comfortable with. And it's a good learning process. You're absolutely right, Susanna. I've been on a number of webinars the past week and I have a, a number yet to go on, on exploring Instagram Live, YouTube, Facebook Live, and Zoom, just to figure out what's out there and then figure out what best suits my needs. I think the unfortunate thing, speaking as a business owner, is you don't know until you try. And you have to give everything that you do a certain amount of time. And if your clientele or the people that you want to see you respond, then that's where you stay. And it would be nice to say, oh, you do this, therefore you should put there. I mean, obviously visual artists should use a visual platform, but that's not always the case. So, sorry, I wish we had a better answer for you. There's some ideas. Here's a question. Um, what is the best advice for planning for indetermined timelines? We have no idea of when. All right. Well, just like everybody else is doing it, um, I mentioned earlier that, you know, you take it day by day and week by week. Um, things change very quickly. Um, it's unfortunate, but um, yeah, there are so many big decisions that we can't, um, we can't really think about what's going to happen in a week because uh, everything just changes so quickly. So I, I would say just take it a week by week and be easy on yourself. Um, things are going to change. Who knows what life is going to be like a month from now or, you know, two months from now. So I would just uh, uh, cut it into smaller um, digestible um, chunks and, and do it that way. And, and I and just I want to add on to that, Jerry, if I may. Please. I think, I think that it's really great to do what, exactly what Hueda said, take it in digestible chunks. Don't try to pressure yourself too, too much to looking out forward into an unknown future. But one thing we do know is what we don't know. And so we don't know when this is going to end, what the changes are going to be, what the ramifications are going to be, if there are gonna be peaks and valleys and what the you know, overall effects are going to be to our businesses, to our organizations, to our lives. So one thing that we're doing as an organization is laying out several scenarios. 
And of course, those may change and we're gonna have to keep taking the pulse much more frequently than we normally would. But I think that at least by saying, well, this could happen and this is how, if that happens, we should react. At least you're putting some sort of a plan in place with the knowledge that it could all change. It could all, none of us expected that we would be on this Zoom call addressing this particular topic uh, four weeks ago, right? And so uh, it is important to be flexible, to be adaptable, to be resilient. But I think that as much as one can do some sort of forward planning, laying out different possibilities that can be very reassuring because at least you've already thought it through and you may have to change it. But I would say that in this moment where there is a lot of fear, we also need to come up with some courage of our own and face the possibilities, not just leave them there as the you know, white elephants and not, not address them ourselves. Right. You're absolutely right, Susanna. I, I agree on the flexibility point. And I think it's also important to uh, not be too concrete right now, to give yourself a lot of different avenues to go in. And also don't be, don't become locked into a particular plan and don't become emotionally invested in a plan because it's going to change. Just let it go. Absolutely. I do want to reference some of the things that Kathy did mention earlier. Again, I know as a business owner, if you're clear on your values, whether you're an organization, a business, or an artist, if you're clear on your values, if you're clear on your brand, if you're clear on your deliverable and what's important to you, and those don't have to be concrete, then every time the world shifts and you take a look at, should I do this, should I not do that, you just weigh it up against that. Does this align with what it is that we are willing to do? We've had so many opportunities. We've had so many hit and falls um, having come from corporate and then doing art festivals and uh, the list goes on. I've probably tried marketing art in every single way, legal, ethical, and moral that's possible. And you take a look at it and you just say, if it aligns with my values, I can investigate it further. And if not, I'm not going to look at that until you make, once you've made up your mind. And that helps diminish the, oh my gosh, I don't know what to do, I can't start. At least it gives you a place to start and grow from there. Just wanted to add that. Speaking of which, here's a question. Should I offer a discount on my art? I know that people are, um, sometimes they panic and they worry and they want to bring in some, um, whatever income they can. Um, Kathy, did you have something you might want to add to that? Sure. I would think about uh, whether you could figure out a way to articulate it as a lower price product, either going to a print or going to a smaller piece or um, cleaning out all the inventory. So you can articulate that this is um, some, or there's a reason for why you've got it as a lower price, because the moment you start to discount your work, that you've discounted the value of your new work. So if you're discounting, find a reason for it to be discounted. That makes perfect sense. We get asked that a lot as we work with a lot of artists. Um, we will be sending out an email to everybody that has attended and we'll have a number of references inclusive of Kathy's uh, blog. And we'll also have a link to my favorite art place because you clays are a way to be able to sell your art um, without discounting the value of your originals. And we do help people take their own digital captures. Okay, another question that we had. Oh, this is an interesting one. Should I create products, artwork that reflect the time that we're in and how would that be perceived? Um, I would go with something that's calming and restful versus something that's focused on isolation. Uh, go back to my, my comment about seven, something that's 70% green changes brain chemistry by, uh, by increasing dopamine, serotonin, and oxytocin. And really, that's going to appeal to a marketplace more than something that maybe you personally want to create something that that echoes how you feel right now 
but that may not be appealing to an audience. I'm going to jump in here and I'm going to add to what Kathy said, which I think is important for certain individual artists who are keen right now to produce art that is for sale and that they want to appeal to those audiences. And Kathy's absolutely right. But then if you have the ability or the inclination to create art for this time, about this time, that is about your self-expression and uh, pouring out your creative reactions to this. If we think back to the one prior crisis, not exactly the same, but the AIDS crisis. And you think of the artists that produced works during that time, such as Jean-Michel Basquiat, who sadly uh, was lost before his time, died very young, but whose work was considered at the beginning very jarring, very different, uh, obviously affected by what he saw going on around him, the sickness, the death of this terrible, tragic uh, illness that you know struck uh, the gay population in such a terrible way. And so I would say, stay true to yourself. I mean, artists, ha you have your own unique voice as an artist. That's the beauty of it. No one can copy you. I mean, people can, but maybe you hope they do because that would mean that you were worth copying. But I would say, don't just uh, express what you think the public wants to have, wants to hear, wants to see. Make it be authentic. The best way to convey your message, to be able to share your art and to sell your art is to be yourself and to be authentic and to be real and unlike anyone else. So Jerry, to answer the should I, I would say I don't see a reason why not. Um, this is really a time and an experience that people remember for a long time. So, um, and you've seen how museums have created some social media campaigns to recreate famous works of art and as they're self-isolating. And Susanna had mentioned the balcony art in Italy and, and, and all that, so, so why not? Terrific, thank you. This is all such good information. I look forward to sharing it for, um, I look forward to sharing it, thank you. Um, oh, here's an interesting question. Should I tape myself creating my artwork, perhaps a time lapse to drum up interest? Definitely. Uh, I think that people find time lapse. I was doing time lapse uh, from my demos earlier this year, and people love to watch them. Uh, a time lapse of, a, of an hour of painting is less than a minute. They're engaging they get people who are not into not don't think they're into art into the, into what you're doing and it it's eye-catching i totally agree with that terrific and in the information that we'll be emailing to the people that are attending this i have some youtube videos on how to record time lapse on iphones and androids if you have a camera that's another thing Um, if I start doing eBlast, what platform works best in your opinion and how often should I be doing this? I could dive in first. Um, how often do you have something to say? And because think about, you want to do something that's sustainable. You don't want to start something and then not follow up with it because you're, you'll build momentum and then it won't go anywhere. So think about creating something that's short and think about it as a marketing campaign because that's what it is it's a marketing it's a campaign and you have a plan you have a program of how you're going to uh com what you're going to communicate one idea artists have is to take different images a series of of the painting or the whatever it is they're creating and take it at different points in time and use each one of those as a point in your campaign. It builds interest, it builds um, people connecting to, they can't wait to see what's next um, and the next steps. Another idea or another resource, um, there used to be a great publication, 
periodical called Professional Artists, which sadly went away in, uh, a couple years ago, but I was just on their website and uh, the website still exists and it still has um, nuggets and ideas and articles from the old magazine. Um, so professionalartist.com, if you go under news and then click down to marketing, there's all sorts of great marketing ideas in there. So that could give you ideas for how and what you would include in your periodic uh, email campaign. Um, and Jerry, I, um, in, in terms of what tools to uh, use, uh, platform, I personally like Constant Contact very much. Um, it really depends on your audience. So what your goal is and what your message that you're trying to convey, but um, you can have a monthly newsletter that highlights all the, your normal operations and you can have additional ones if you want to feature additional services or art. It really depends on what you're trying to um, achieve at that point. But uh, a platform like Constant Contact, um, they have great um, tools that you can use to track your open rates, click-through rates and things like that. So it should help you decide how successful each one of your um, campaigns are. That's terrific. And, and it's a low cost to entry or almost a no cost to entry for people that are just getting started and building the list, right? Right. That is good. Um, here's a question. What do you see as a positive outcome of the time that we are in? And I'm, I want to jump in and speak first to this um, because I found something that I thought was interesting. It was a viewpoint I hadn't thought of before, which is that the social distancing and travel restrictions gives galleries and art fairs an opportunity to test digital sales strategies, such as the virtual reality and the online auctions. And I do know that there are a lot of online auctions that are being scheduled now and planned now and figured out the best method and that's a great outreach for anybody that sells a tangible product. The crisis might re reveal a lower cost way of doing business that might become an industry standard. So um, there's that um, invention is the mother of necessity. I agree completely. All of us are learning digital tools and testing modalities and strategies that we all knew we should have been doing but just hadn't gotten around to doing it. In other words, what we knew was important but hadn't gotten around to because it wasn't urgent is now urgent. The other thing is I think I wanna echo the point about taking time to really notice what's going on and, and stepping back from ourselves and noticing our surroundings and using that for our, our inspiration. I think this has given us a time to slow down and think about what's really important to us and we should use that going forward and not lose sight of that. And uh, I think too, Terry. Sorry, go ahead, Hueda. <laughs> go ahead, Susanna. I, I, I was going to just add that I think also this period is uh, forcing us to feel more interconnected. And it's ironic, right? We're self-isolating um, or supposed to be, but at the same time, we can't be in a vacuum because anything that someone else does could affect us. And so we are having to think of each other and think of our planet. Uh, one of the effects that not having a million people on the road is that suddenly and you can see the Himalayas uh, and uh, LA has no more smog. And you, so there have been some actual beneficial uh, things for the planet uh, that have come out of this. But I think that the sense of that we need each other, we need each other to be each of us responsible, not just for ourselves, but for what we can cause the harm and the good that we can bring to others. And I think that that's much more in our minds, in the forefront of our minds, uh, that you know is something that's happened and is happening during this period. And from an organizational perspective, um, this 
as I mentioned earlier, it has forced us to have this new dialogue. And it's, so it's this new dialogue that we're having with our audience that's, that's really the positive outcome of this. Uh, we're becoming stronger by listening to the needs of the, that are being dictated by the new normal. And uh, we're becoming more adaptable. And when, once we come out of uh, the end of this, we're, we're definitely going to see ourselves as more resilient. And that's never wrong, that's never bad. Here's another question. Um, if you have a website, is a podcast good to have? If so, how often? I'm gonna go ahead and address this because um, we've participated in the podcast community for a very long time. Um, whether you, you should have a website, but maybe you don't have that kind of a business. If you have something to share, if you have something of value, podcasting is a great way to go. If you don't know how to get started, um, go to meetup.com. There's plenty of people who are interested in helping. If um, another way to get started is by reaching out to see if you can be a guest on other people's podcasts. And then as you're working up information to be able to share, contribute to society, then you can create your own. Um, does anybody else want to say something about podcasting? Yeah, actually, I was on a webinar about podcasting in my continual search of webinars of what I need to be thinking about. And it was brought up that now more than ever, people are listening to podcasts because they're out walking, they're out jogging, they're out doing things. And what they don't want to um, just jog or walk or whatever. And they're tired of m maybe listening to uh the music they've been listening to. So podcasts have actually, the list, the amount of people listening to podcasts has increased tremendously during this time period. So if now, if you've thought about podcasts, now's the time to do it. And the other great thing about podcasting is it's so niche. There is a gentleman in Ocala that has a program that is played when the horse stalls are being cleaned because he's target marketing those people who clean the stalls of the horses. So if you have a niche market, if you have to find your target market down to that, you can find these people on podcasts and that might be your most cost efficient, um, energy efficient way to go. Okay. Um, We have time for two more questions and then we, I've got one that I'm holding on to because it's the perfect one to end with. Uh, here's one which may have been addressed earlier. Um, are you creating a plan for once the economy picks back up and what does that look like? That's a big question. Um, Kathy? Sure, I'm definitely in, I'm in the data gathering stage as I talked about earlier and both for myself and for Florida Watercolor Society. For Florida Watercolor Society, we have a committee and we're exploring how we're going to implement um, the virtual channels that we knew we needed to do. And, uh, and once we figure out our, get through our data gathering stage, we're going to be coming up with our implementation plan. And as Susanna said, you definitely need to have multiple plans considering multiple uh, approaches or multiple t timelines of what's happening and also what your marketplace is uh, responding to. So have multiple plans, different decision points, and uh, definitely stick with it. Don't drop whatever you've learned during this time period in terms of what you need to do and keep implementing it. Terrific. And I know that both the Morian and TBBCA are doing the what if scenarios which is never a wrong thing to do. And you know, Jerry, because we don't know if we're going to be allowed to um, open at 100% all at once. Everything, we will just wake up one day and everything is going to go back to normal or we're going to have to make small adjustments. So we figured out all these different scenarios if we're only um, working at 25%, 50%, 75% or, or what happens when we're back at 100% and what, what's that going to look like? So we really have to, um, it's, it's the, the, some really tough questions. Some of them we can't answer, but you know, we're doing our best to um, figure that out. 
And we have to think about not only what we're allowed to do, but what people are going to want to do. And those yeah. two might not be the same. Very and I, good point. I think that's a really good point. And I was about to say myself that uh, building on what Kathy just said, the world is going to change. It's just not going to go back. Even if you go back to TBBCA's cultural encounters and other events and impact awards and the Morian and the other museums and galleries and individual artists showing, it's not going to be quite exactly the same. And again, it may go in phases. It may be that they, you can do smaller group gatherings. It may be that during those gatherings, you have to uh, exercise some sort of social distancing. We just, we don't know. But what we're learning now of the ways and the platforms that we are using and having to use and having to learn to, in order to communicate and for the artists to get their art out there, those are things that we can then leverage in the future. So I think that there's gonna be a hybrid of what we did before, what we're doing now, and hopefully those two will come together to build a better way of doing things in the future. That will be our new normal. So I'm going to share, uh, to end one comment that came over to us on the Q and A's. It says, thanks to these art leaders who have shared their ideas, wisdom, in a calm and positive manner. So I sincerely thank my round table guests, your time, your energy, your input in doing this. For the attendees, the people who have um, been listening, we hope that we've offered you value, ideas, things to think about, things to talk about. Let's continue the conversation. Uh, we will be sending everybody a link. Uh, parts of this might go on social media, but this is a conversation that needs to continue as it, as it grows. So thank you to everybody. And thank you to World Creativity and Innovation Week for allowing us to be underneath their umbrella and sharing this information with people around the planet. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everybody.